Hi guys, it's Dr. Lily Johnston. I have for you this week, another reaction video. This comes from Dr. Nick Verhoeven and his channel Physionic. He wanted to talk about how we were all wrong about cholesterol. And you know, I just couldn't resist the opportunity to take a watch and see what he has to say. I really like Nick's channel. He is a nerd like me and goes into great depth about some of the molecular mechanisms underlying a lot of the health biology that we talk about here. So uh, if you haven't heard of him, please go give that channel a watch and let's see what we can learn about cholesterol today. If you guys are new here, I am Dr. Lily Johnston. I am a board certified vascular surgeon. I also specialize in cardiometabolic prevention, so you never need me as a surgeon. Without further ado, let's go watch Physionic. And bad cholesterol. That's how I was initially taught about the cholesterol containing particles in our bloodstream. And that's probably how it's still taught to patients and in basic physiology courses. But it's a lie. Well, maybe I took that a bit too far. It's not exactly a lie, actually. Nothing of the sort. But it does speak to the evolution in science, especially as it relates to good cholesterol, known as HDL cholesterol. So here's what I'd like to do. I've pulled seven studies on HDL, and I'd like to explain why the doctors of the past may have been wrong about HDL as it relates to heart health. It's not all that good of a cholesterol after all. And we have multiple lines of evidence proving that to be true. Then I'd like to explain why HDL cholesterol may be the wrong focus and something else might be on the horizon that may be significantly better. First, we should. So I'm actually really excited about this video. This is not where I thought he was going with all of this, but HDL, the good cholesterol, right? This is a very misunderstood thing. And this is probably the next big frontier of lipidology in terms of how we think about the function of this molecule, measuring the amount of it is what we have historically done. And to some extent, the amount does correlate, at least when it's low, with risk for more cardiac events. But we have tried many times to raise HDL cholesterol pharmacologically. It has never worked yet. And uh, I'm excited to see what he has come up with understand why scientists and doctors even thought that HDL cholesterol was a good cholesterol in the first place. I mean, they did have their reasons. Back in the 1970s and for several decades later, it was believed that HDL cholesterol or so-called good cholesterol may be protective against heart disease because it often tracked with lower heart disease rates. Said differently, the higher your blood HDL cholesterol levels, the lower your risk of having a heart attack. You might be aware of the saying that correlation beeth not causation, however, or correlation is not causation. Essentially, just because something tracks with an outcome, reduced heart disease, does not necessarily mean that it caused this protection against heart disease. And we've seen this, right? That was my whole point about we've tried raising HDL cholesterol and it has been ineffective. And there were some other problems with those drugs. And we were never sure if it was the fact that they just didn't raise HDL very well or that they did some other bad things. But if you were going to try to make the leap from correlation into causation, what you would need to show is that raising HDL actually reduced events. Now, I think that there's an interesting quibble here, which is that, you know, yes, the higher HDL was associated with less risk, but actually it was really that the low HDL was associated with high risk. And that is seen in insulin resistance metabolic syndrome, right? We see triglycerides go up and we see HDL go down. So the normal, normal high HDL, whether that's protective or not, we don't know. What we know is that the low HDL is definitely what has been associated with harm and increased risk in the past. One way to test if HDL cholesterol causes heart disease protection is to raise it independently of anything else. So, you know, like 10, 15 years ago or so, pharmaceutical companies and other institutions created drugs to raise HDL cholesterol. In the end, they showed that HDLC did not cause a protective effect against cardiovascular disease like heart-specific disease. Even using natural substances like niacin, which is vitamin B3, which is known to raise HDL cholesterol, had no effect as seen here. The higher the lines go, the more cardiovascular disease occurred. Since both lines are similar, confirmed statistically over four years of treatment, the conclusion was that niacin, at least in this formulation, did not protect the heart, although it raises HDL cholesterol. So you guys have perhaps seen my other video where we talk a little bit about niacin in the context of LP little a. We'll put that link up here for you. The 
other thing to know about niacin is that it does some other things, right? It not it didn't just independently increase HDL without other consequences. It may also have hurt the liver. It may have caused more insulin resistance and problems with glycemic control, even new onset diabetes. Uh, all of those things could be, you know, it's not that the HDL wasn't helpful, but it's that those other things offset any benefit. So I think especially for these trials, we have to be a little bit careful about what else those, drug di those drugs did and any off-target effects that they may have had. I should quickly mention, because some people have been following my work for a few years now and may ask, there are trials that show that niacin is effective against cardiovascular disease, as I've covered before, but the doses tend to be higher and the formulation is different. So it's possible and even likely that we can't blame HDL cholesterol for this lack of effectiveness. And in fact, there were other drugs that were tried, but these drugs designed to raise this good cholesterol actually showed harm, causing people to die more when they were on them. So. Is it the HDL or is it the off-target effects causing this lack of an effect? Well, there's... Only one of the CTEP inhibitors actually caused significant harm. The others were not very helpful. And in fact, we have not totally abandoned the entire class of CTEP inhibitors. There is one more that is currently still in clinical trials. And uh, for many reasons, some people hope that that, of course, will have a different outcome. We'll, uh, we'll stay tuned for that. No doubt that the molecule used to raise HDL cholesterol makes a difference, especially since some, some of those molecules have some additional effects, if you know what I mean, muddying the conclusions. However, better studies with better interventions like this one, where other blood fats like LDL cholesterol are kept stable, still show no benefit of exclusively raising HDL cholesterol. So in combination across multiple randomized controlled trials designed to study this one issue, no matter how you slice it, it looks like actually raising HDL cholesterol has no heart protection effect. Heck, we don't even need to rely on clinical trials, which of course have their methodological issues, like what we touched on. We can turn to genetics. For example, did you know that there are people among us that have naturally high HDL cholesterol levels? There are people with a series of gene mutations that will raise HDL. So we can compare their lifelong elevated HDL cholesterol to people without these gene mutations, people with normal HDL cholesterol. Now, of course, a common question comes up, well, sure, their HDL cholesterol may be high, but you know, what else is different? That's a good and fair question if you were thinking it. The way these studies are done, the researchers focus on genes that only raise HDL with no impact anywhere else. Beyond that, these studies are a lot like randomized controlled trials, but better because people are randomly put into a high HDL cholesterol group or a control group at birth. And when we group all the different groups of people with these mutations compared against those without, here we have 20 different studies. This is a forest plot, so the individual studies have their data shown in the black squares. So if the squares move to the left of the vertical middle line, there's reduced risk of myocardial infarction, which is a fancy way of saying heart attack. But all the data combined into one easy to read score is at the very bottom as the diamond. No matter how you slice it, if that's the pool data or even as the most individual studies, those with lifelong elevated HDL cholesterol do not experience protection from heart disease, at least by this metric. And make no mistake, other similar studies also show these results to be true. All in all, now the genetic studies confirm the clinical data that HDL cholesterol does not directly protect the heart. This is in opposition of the epidemiological evidence. So then, is HDL cholesterol useless then? Well, not quite. In fact, it tells us several important things, including something that scientists have been relatively recently been discovering. Before I get into all that, you know that there have been these uh, banners on the screen? Those are to let you know that if you want more information on each section, like the genetic studies or how two other blood markers relate to cardiovascular disease, and even something called HDL dysfunction and how it's getting more and more attention and how to think about this new HDL dysfunction evidence, then check out the full version of this video that you're watching. You'll get an accompanying article, including simple summary and much more as a physionic insight. Insider. The Physionic Insiders is my research platform and comes with all these perks, like a private podcast, live sessions, and much more. If you want a deep dive analysis of your health delivered to you every week, consider joining. The link to join the Physionic Insiders is in the description. I hope to see you there. Okay, let's start here. This is the relationship between death and HDL cholesterol. And all you need to know is if the lines go up, that ain't good. Now, this shows an association between low HDL here and high HDL here, being linked to increased risk of death. So what I'm trying to say to you is, if HDL cholesterol is very low, or if it's very high, there may be a warning sign there. Something may be wrong. Consider it like a... I will just point out that these J-shaped curves are ubiquitous in biology. We see it for 
very, very many different types of variables. It's true for body weight, it's true for this HDL molecule, and this is a very common finding where there's this happy middle ground and um, it's the Goldilocks effect, right? If it's too low or the porridge is too cold, it's not good. If it's too hot and it's too high, it's also not good. Um, very common finding across all of biology here. And again, I think we're, what we're about to get into is this idea that all we have measured to date about HDL is its amount, like just the sheer amount. And HDL is a very functional molecule. It transports cholesterol in, in what is called reversed cholesterol transport. And that has always been the mechanism by which we think it may provide protection, is to potentially traffic lipids out of the arterial wall and other places where they don't belong. But that is all about function. You can imagine that lipids might get trapped in the HDL particles, and then it's dysfunctional. The number still looks good, but the HDL isn't working very well. And I think the next frontier is, is probably where Nick's going to go for us to understand a little bit more about what we can do to measure the functionality of these molecules rather than just their total amount. A yellow flag, not necessarily causative of harm, but it should raise questions as to why the values are so low or so high. Usually that's reflected in other health, poor health metrics as well. Now the other thing, that it might tell us about is potential HDL dysfunction. Now, for us to get into this last part, I'm gonna take a step back and uh, because I've been making some assumptions up to now, like you knowing the difference between HDL and HDL cholesterol, which are actually two different things. If you're looking at me with a face of like confusion like this, then <laughs> you're who I'm talking to, unless that's always your face, in which case it's a toss up. You don't have to love the system that we live in to stop being crushed by it. I hate that capitalism creates a hierarchy. HDL stands uh, for high density lipoprotein, and it's a particle that contains cholesterol. Easy peasy. So when we're talking about HDL cholesterol, we're talking about the measure of the cholesterol molecules found inside the HDL particle. They're related, but HDL cholesterol measures don't fully inform on the number or function of the HDL particles themselves. So I'm bringing this up because so if you've ever heard me talk about lipids, I sometimes talk about the uh, truck driver analogy, right? The particles are the Amazon Prime trucks. The cholesterol itself is the cargo in the back of the truck. So in general, historically, we've just always measured packages. We've measured the total cholesterol numbers from the LDL particles, the HDL particles, and all we have measured as cargo. In fact, the number of particles is also very important. As our lab testing has gotten better, we have measured particles in addition to the cholesterol that they carry. And finally, I think this next frontier is going to be function. And let's see what we can learn about that. While we've seen some considerable evidence that raising HDL cholesterol does not protect against heart disease directly, we do not know if raising the particle number, the number of vessels, or the quality of those particles could be directly helpful. The actual particle can become dysfunctional, meaning that it doesn't work as effectively as it should. That also means that people with exceedingly low or exceedingly high LDL cholesterol may also suffer from HDL dysfunction. This is an area that's currently being investigated. I know I've been talking a while, but here's how I would approach this all based on the evidence. So I would pay loose attention to my HDL cholesterol numbers. If they are within range, not too low, not too high, I wouldn't think about it more than that and move on to other health markers like, uh, I don't know, fasting blood glucose, uh, LDL, ApoB, and so on. If my values were very low or very high, I would not focus on trying to raise or lower them exclusively. I'd probably look at other tests like triglycerides, my fat mass, and other areas that, of my health that affect my total health rather than focusing on the HDL cholesterol number itself, even if it's giving me a potential warning. The reality is, your HDL cholesterol is more so a marker than something to directly target. I think calling it a good cholesterol isn't necessarily wrong considering that it doesn't directly contribute to risk, but it's more so a neutral cholesterol than anything. Now you wanna know another area that doctors had to rethink? Well, blood pressure and heart disease, I discuss it. So I would agree with this. I, I hear a lot of patients tell me that we don't have to worry about their ApoB or their LDLC because their HDL is great. And I think that this, again, is uh, an evolving concept in the lipidology community. Yes, if you have an excellent triglyceride to HDL ratio, you are more than likely insulin sensitive and you don't have metabolic syndrome, good. That is not a risk factor that you have. That doesn't mean you don't have other risk factors and it doesn't mean it cancels out the presence of um, significantly elevated ApoB or if you have plaque, how we should address that. So I agree with Nick here that, you know, it's um, pretty neutral and it doesn't 
overtake the presence of, of other risk factors. In depth right here. Thanks for tuning in. I hope this was helpful and I'll speak with you in the next one. Bye. Overall, a really nice video. I think it's a great start for the average person who's just getting to know HDL cholesterol and HDL particles. Um, I'm hopeful that maybe he'll come back and do another deep dive in terms of how we think about HDL functionality and the different fractions of HDL. That is now something that's being measured and I don't know a huge amount about that. I would love to learn more about that. Overall, uh, I think this was a great video and I enjoyed watching it. Thanks, Nick. You can find a link to Nick's video down in the description below. Please go over to his channel and if you like this video, uh, subscribe to his channel, send him a like and really encourage additional content like this in the future.